Welcome to Speaking of Business, conversations with Canadian innovators, entrepreneurs, and business leaders. I'm Goldie Hyder, President and CEO of the Business Council of Canada. Today's episode is with Kaelin Revenescu, President and CEO of Air Canada. Kaelin was just five years old when his parents fled the communist regime in Romania and settled in Montreal, an experience that profoundly shaped his identity and values. As you'll hear, his dedication to the success of his company and the country is unshakable. I spoke with Kaelin in April, prior to the news of the company's Air Transat takeover bid. But the deal reflects many of the themes of today's podcast, including Kaelin's approach to leadership, calculated risk, and competition. Enjoy our conversation. Kaelin, thanks so much for doing this. Oh, my pleasure, Goldie. Glad to be here. Looking forward to learning more about you and the story of our Canada. Why don't we start at the beginning? You know, last time I was here, we we chatted about your parents. Uh, They came from Romania. You were five years old. I told you my story of my family coming here from India, and I was seven years old. And here you are, CEO of Air Canada. I'm sure we'll get to that part of it, but let's start at the beginning. What do you remember about that time moving to Canada? And and talk a little about your parents as well. You know, the earliest memory I think I have is uh, when I went to my first days of school in grade one, which was shortly after we arrived. And of course, at that stage, I didn't speak a word of English. And I was in a school where all the kids spoke English. You know, I remember looking around the room when we were meant to take a nap on our hands. And and I remember the teacher saying, put your head down. And I, I didn't understand what that meant. I came back that night at home and I asked my, my parents, they said something that sounded like, put your head down. And I couldn't understand what that, what that meant. And, you know, it's that operating in that gray zone of not fully understanding what's going on and having to kind of figure it out with your instincts. And as I think back, it actually is a quite an interesting zone to operate in. And, and almost a sixth sense. Almost a sixth sense. I knew ultimately what it was that I needed to do. And sooner or later, I figured it out. And sooner or later, I knew what the expressions were. And sooner or later, knew how to talk to people, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that it's that, that uh, dynamic is something that defines, I think, many, many of the immigrant families that, uh, that come and establish themselves uh, here. And, uh, you know, my parents both had significant educations. They were both highly educated people. One was a doctor. Your dad was a doctor. My dad was a doctor, in fact, a surgeon. And for him, it was important to uh, continue to be able to not only practice medicine, but to practice his specialty. So he had to go back and finish his uh, residency again, even though he had already done it. Some issues have not changed. He'd have to do that still today. He'd have to do that again, exactly. (laughs) So he had to get requalified as a surgeon. He was not going to be satisfied to uh, just practice general medicine. And so he got uh, requalified and that meant, you know, working. Uh, without any uh, any income for a period of time to be able to achieve that. And my mother had uh, several, she had two degrees and she had several qualifications. She spoke several languages. She had experience with cultural relations with China, but she got a job, you know, just a, a basic job in retail to support us while my father was going through his yeah, training. Us so being you and your sister. My sister and myself, correct. And so, you know, I'd say that generally it was a very, very modest existence, but one that was truly filled with optimism, which I think has shaped a lot of my uh, vision on life. It's interesting you speak of optimism, but when I think of, you know, what your parents or my parents went through, I come up with the word perseverance, that they were just determined to succeed. How much did what they went through affect you in terms of your own journey to becoming who you are? Because you've had to persevere through a lot of things yourself. Perseverance, you know, this is, you know, we we, um, often talk about the immigrant mindset, and there is for sure a mindset, and it existed then and it exists today. It's a combination of certainly of perseverance, of optimism, of a certain level of insecurity, because nobody owes you anything. Uh, nobody owes you a free lunch. You have to go and earn that lunch yourself. No one is going to give you the benefit of the doubt, because typically you have funny sounding last names, as I do, and as uh, you may have as well. And as a result of that, you end up, you know, while you can be optimistic and while you can persevere, you also know that it's up to you to achieve. And therefore, you're going to be much more focused on all of the lessons you take, both lessons you take from failure as well as lessons that uh, you take from uh, victories. Now, you talk about the immigrant mindset, you know, as you look at where we are as a country, obviously shaped largely by immigrants, if not uh, almost entirely with the exception of the uh, indigenous communities. How much of that mindset is driven by hunger? 
how much of it is driven by coming from a place that clearly isn't necessarily as good as Canada was or is or will ever be? Well, you know, the the, um, uh, necessity has uh, driven a lot of the immigration that we face. In fact, we talk about immigration, but many of the uh, immigrants, and frankly, even my parents were, you know, quasi-refugees. They basically were leaving the country without any, you know, clear vision as to where they were going when they were leaving. And so it for sure has a, a component of necessity. And survival instincts uh, do kick in. And in some cases, you know, you have a little bit of luck along the way. I mean, I would not uh, Hmm. say that everyone's story is going to be identical to our story or or your story. And, you know, we were lucky and we were lucky to be right place, right time, lucky to be exposed to some of the people we've met along the way. I've been lucky, you know, to have had uh, lots of, you know, good mentors along the way and people who've given me the benefit of the doubt. But generally, it's the Mm -hmm. necessity that has driven a lot of that immigrant mindset. So when you think about some of the things we just talked about perseverance, optimism, necessity, level of insecurity as to whether or not you're going to succeed. I think those are all very healthy drivers, quite frankly, for business as well as society at large. Well, you've said a lot there. I'm going to unpack that slowly over the course of this podcast. Why don't we start with immigration? It's certainly an area that I wanted to cover with you. A hot public policy issue in many parts of the world. I think it's fair to say many people think that the opposition to uh, you know, Brexit or the support for Brexit and uh, the support for Donald Trump was driven by anti-trade sentiment, but really it's being redefined as anti-immigrant sentiment. How do you feel about that issue itself? How do you feel about how Canada's managing that issue? And when, and what should we do as we go forward on the issue of immigration? So you know, I'm a big believer, not only because of where my family came from, I'm a, I'm a big believer that, uh, you know, a, a uh, open policy to immigration, when I say open, one that has got, you know, rules. Uh, appropriate yeah. rules around it, because, you know, certainly my parents followed the rules and my expectation is that there needs to be somewhat of a rules-based, cannot be a complete free-for-all, but a open rules-based based driven system will be extremely valuable to the uh, Canadian economy, to the Canadian psyche, and you know, dare I say, to the Canadian culture. And, uh, you know, by this, I mean that we see the baby boom generation coming to an end, uh, lots of baby boomers uh, retiring. We know there is going to be a massive uh, need for qualified, skilled employment coming up. The idea that we can supply that with a low population growth in a low population country is just not feasible and and not something that will allow Canada to continue to be a a world leader. So, you know, when, when I look at it quite apart from any emotional sentiment I might have around immigration, I also think about the fact that, you know, just as a driver of economic development, it's going to be extremely important for us to continue to openly welcome and, you know, qualified immigration in the areas that are uh, that are needed and are relevant for the country within some open rules-based uh, system. So when it came time to choose a career track, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to be? You chose law school. Why did you do that? You know, we had, uh, interestingly enough, uh, my father, who, as we said, was a, a doctor, a, a surgeon, and he was very proud of that and would have very much uh, like to think that I would become a doctor. And uh, so I disappointed him in that dream because it was not, uh, you know, while while uh, I was okay in science-related subjects, it was not a, certainly not a passion for me. And uh, my father was quite involved in my decision to go to law school. And he was the one who encouraged me to study in French. It was right around the time of the Parti Québécois coming into, uh, into Quebec and, you know, the dynamic of Quebec becoming more and more uh, you, if you mm-hmm. want to succeed in Quebec, you needed to be able to speak French fluently. And um, we always saw law as a great discipline, great discipline to do many other things from. Um, I practiced law indeed for 20 years, basically. And then it also gave me great opportunities to do other things. And so law was uh, you know, not necessarily where I would end up, but law was a great place to get the uh, grounding and the basis to do to do many many other things and not to be afraid of something complicated and not to be afraid of hundreds of pages of of a, of a document and to be able to have a sufficient understanding of the way things function. Right. So we thought it was a good you know good foundation. Good foundation. Well, you must be uh, good at it, and certainly we're good at it. Uh, right out of law school, you were recruited to you know, one of the top law firms in the country at Steichman Elliott. 
And Stanley Hart was there, former Prime Minister, Moroni's chief of staff. Stanley Hart indeed was there and was, was you know, I'd say that I had uh, four senior partners of that uh, generation who were all relevant, who were all key in my evolution. And Stanley Hart was certainly one of the four. And, you know, we learned a lot of... Uh, techniques more than uh, simply the law. You know, we learned a lot of techniques from Stanley. Well. And uh, <laughs> his, his, he had a very unique personal style. And, uh, you know, he was uh, somebody who uh, could shoot from the hip. He was somebody who was quick on his feet. He'd be loved throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what stuck. A great creative mind and encouraged us to think out of the box. And so really a fantastic and, you know, relatively unique personality. Well, that sets up my next question very nicely, which is I saw a quote from you saying, they taught me to be nimble on my feet, uh, to be a quick study, to occasionally BS uh, and shoot from the hip when needed. Yeah, no, this is it. You know, we, he, uh, uh, I remember one of the early meetings that he sent me to when I was an articling student and it was a uh, financing of a film. He was, in those days, he was one of the leaders of the uh, emerging Canadian film industry. And, you know, he was probably working on four or five deals at the same time. He had a television show. He was involved in uh, labor arbitrations and five or six different things all at the same time. And so he sent me to one of his meetings that he couldn't attend. Uh, he had not told the people... Uh, ahead of time that I was coming. And so everyone was expecting the great Stanley Hart to show up at the meeting. And instead they had an uh, understudy. wet behind, <laughs> yeah, wet behind the ears understudy. And it was on a, on a topic that I had not had a lot of, as an articling student, I'd not had a lot of visibility around, including, uh, you know, it was a public offering. There was a prospectus involved. There were securities commissions involved. There was a completion guarantor for the film involved. <laughs> and, you know, I had trouble understanding what the terms meant, let alone helping these people solve their issues. And so, yeah, you had to be pretty nimble on your feet and do so, a little so bit you of BS'd it? <laughs> fast, fancy footwork. And yeah, you know, at least have some semblance of having a strategy as to how you're going to answer the questions. <laughs> That's a great story. Thanks for sharing. Now, Steichman, ironically, is where you got involved with Air Canada first. You were very young at the time. How did that come about? Uh, well, again, you know, you talk about great mentors and, and influence from various people. Another name, in addition to Stanley Hart, that uh, you would know, uh, Goldie, is David Angus who uh, was the uh, in those days the chief fundraiser for uh, mm -hmm. Brian Mulroney and uh, was a senator uh, subsequent uh, to that. Senator and subsequent was to that. In, in our caucus when yep. I was there. Exactly. Senator subsequent to that and uh, and one of the senior leaders at uh, Steichman Elliott at the time and uh, subsequently also on the Air Canada board. And so when Air Canada was searching around for counsel for the privatization, which mm -hmm. was in 1987, so I was 31 years old, David... Uh, put me forward as a potential candidate to be the lead outside counsel on the privatization. Now understand that in those days, there had not been any significant Canadian privatizations. This was the first in the Mulroney government. This was the first of the uh, major privatizations. It was on the heels of the British privatizations of British gas, British petroleum, and uh, British airways. So we had learned a lot of lessons from the British and from the British privatizations. And I had minor involvement in all of those privatizations. You know, there was always a Canadian component. So witnessed some of that. And then David Angus put me forward as a potential lead external counsel. And it was one of the great experiences of my life because it enabled me to get really under the covers of everything yeah. going on at that time. See the, uh, you know, transformation of very significant, highly public Crown Corporation into the private sector with all of the complexity and all of the transformational issues and all of the successes and all of the failures. At the same time, you know, we were running a broadly based uh, campaign to uh, offer shares of Air Canada to the public at large, which was, you know, complicated under securities laws and so on. So it was a fantastic eye-opening experience, which dominated a good portion of, uh, I'd say, uh, a year and a half of my life at the time. And it also put me in contact with Claude Taylor. And there's some interesting Claude Taylor anecdotes when one looks back. Claude Taylor was the chairman and chief executive yeah. officer. He uh, was someone that, that I worked very, very closely with during the privatization. And despite the fact that I was uh, so young, he gave me great access. And, you know, under the, the Steve Jobs way of looking back at life through connecting the dots, as you may know, that uh, famous uh, Stanford mm -hmm. uh, commencement address, I've taken the opportunity to look back as well on connecting the dots. And when the privatization was over, Claude Taylor invited me to a private uh, lunch one-on-one -on -one at the Mount Royal Club in Montreal. 
And it was partly to say thank you to me, but but at the same time, he took out a notepad or out of his pocket and he started saying, now, Kalen, I want you to tell me from your perspective, you know, given that you're an outsider to the company, what are the things that you think we haven't been doing correctly? And what would you do if uh, you, were you were in my seat? It says a lot about him, doesn't yeah, well, it? It says a lot about him and a great empowerment. Also says for, a lot about you. For a 31-year-old, yeah. I mean, imagine. So that, in a way, he may not have known it at the time, but it was as if he gave me the secret handshake that related to Air Canada and kind of uh, injected it into my bloodstream, I would mm. say. And then, you know, Air Canada continued to be a big part of my subsequent 20 years. Well, a dozen years later, you joined Air Canada to oversee its restructuring. Now, I gather those were frustrating years. You were there for about 2000 until 2004. What happened? Well, I joined Air Canada on the heels of the uh, Onyx uh, takeover bid. There was a, mm -hmm. a hostile takeover bid made by mm -hmm. Onyx together with... American Airlines and Canadian Airlines. Mm -hmm. Air Canada was the larger of the two airlines in Canada at the time, was seen as the one that was winning the competitive battle. And Canadian had tried to do somewhat of a reverse takeover with Onyx and American Airlines. We defeated that. And then following that victory with Robert Milton as the now CEO, I joined with Robert. And we, Robert and I worked very closely on, on the defense, the hostile bid. And then um, I joined and, and uh, became first... Uh, one of the senior officers, my position at the time was executive VP of corporate development and strategy. And then, you know, we had a vision to create value, lots of different objectives. And then, of course, we had 9-11 and SARS. And 9-11, um, of course, you know, was a catastrophic event for the airline industry in North America, globally, but especially in North America. And Air Canada had the added burden of having had SARS in Toronto, which was one of the two places, uh, as you may remember, that suffered from SARS, and that basically decimated the hub. And the third whammy was the uh, pension, very, very large pension sure. deficit. So those three factors led to the restructuring of Air Canada under CCAA, which occurred in 2003. And I became the chief restructuring officer for that process. See, it was not a frustrating process. It was a very eye-opening process. Very, very, very complicated involving all of the uh, creditors of the company, the aircraft lessors, the mm -hmm. labor unions, uh, governments. It was very complicated, but we did emerge and uh, we emerged, uh, you know, in some respects uh, stronger. I left in 2004 and co-founded an investment bank, Genuity Capital Markets, which subsequently merged with Canaccord. And then you came back. And then I came back and then I came back as CEO 2009? In, in 2009. Yeah. And coming back in 2009, we had uh, been hopeful that the restructuring put the company in a good stead. But then, of course, in 2008, the company, like many others, uh, suffered from the financial crisis, the global financial crisis. Fuel spiked to $140 a barrel. Air Canada was retreating from international markets. The product was suffering. The pension deficit had climbed again to $4 billion. And the company was on its knees and sort of the perfect backdrop, I would say, you know, you talk about the proverbial burning platform. There was mm -hmm. an unbelievable burning platform that Were you we turned had. on by this challenge? And I was turned on by this challenge and I joined April 1st, 2009. People thought it was my version. That was no version. April Fool's joke, eh? Yeah, people thought it was my version <laughs> of an April Fool's joke, but uh, it was a highly stimulating challenge. You know, in the early days, I'd characterize it as crawling around on our bellies, suturing uh, patients without an anesthetic. That sort of was the way we operated. We had to first save the patient before we could have any aspirations to do anything more grandiose. We had a real deadline because under pension funding rules, it had to, we had to figure it out by, I came on April 1st, we had to figure it out by July 31st. And we did. We raised a lot of liquidity in the first months that stabilized us. We then went to rebuilding our product, rebuilding our brand, buying airplanes, fixing our pension deficit, and cobbling the pieces together to create a you know, fairly stable and sustainable. I mean, I'm trying to now use the word sustainable more than just in an environmental context because we Longevity, have now a, last, lasting a very power. sustainable, yeah. a lasting right. organization. Yeah. Well, let's unpack that because that you know you 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 said it in a few minutes here, but it took ten years. I mean, where we are today and ten year anniversary, I guess we would have just passed. So happy anniversary! Thank you. How did you turn the business around? I mean, we, you know, you mentioned that you were turned on by it, and I want to explore both not the minutia of how you turn it around as much as I want to understand how you as a leader approached the crisis. The way we approached it was very, very simply with four key priorities that we kept on 
sticking to really from the very, very first uh, days. We use different phraseology, different terminology as we were getting through the crisis. And frankly, we're still using them today. And we wanted to make sure that the rest of the organization knew what we were doing. So this was as simple words as I could possibly find to explain and to ensure that our then 26,000 today, you know, we're about 31, 32,000 people understand what it is that we're doing. And lots of great companies have got great visions, great ideas that are just communicated behind closed doors or in a CEO's office. So we got out actually early on. And as we were building the restructuring plan, you know, this sounds like obvious today as we're doing podcasts and so on. But in those days, no one did a podcast, no one did a YouTube video. So I started doing YouTube videos in April of 2009, right away, telling our company what it was that we were planning to do. We started with that very, very So communications basic was a key foundation. Communications was a key, was a key driver. Simplicity of the message was a key mm -hmm. driver. Recognition that if we made a mistake and we were going to correct it, we were going to acknowledge the mistake early on was a key driver. We knew that in our business, you know, lots and lots and lots of companies have disappeared off the face of the map. And, you know, you kind of, the list is very long just to, you know, remind, remind folks, because I, I'd like to tell our people about this all the time, you know, lest people think that, uh, you know, we're sort of uh, not fragile as a business, but Pan Am Airlines, TWA Airlines. Eastern Airlines, Sabina, Swiss Air, you know, because the Swiss of today is not the same as the as the Swiss Air that disappeared. Anset in Canada, Canada 3000. The list goes on and Canadian. on. Canadian <laughs> Airlines, Royal Aviation, Greyhound, Roots Air. So companies come and companies go. And so how do you keep something sustainable? And so that message, that resonating message had to be repeated over and over and over and over and over and over. And then our four simple priorities, you know, we had to focus on our cost structure. It's not good enough to say we're going to pat everyone on the back and uh, and say just because we feel good about ourselves that we're going to be successful. We had to deal with our cost structure. We had to deal with our uh, the fact that we were you know diminishing our footprint in international markets. Uh, we were not going to win the battle domestically with a lower cost operator domestically. So we needed to expand our international footprint. We needed to improve our product and we needed to change our culture. So those four things kept on having different phraseology, different expressions up to and including today are key drivers. But uh, part of the message here was communication and then empowering both our executive team and our frontline, letting people make their own, their own decisions. I said, look, I have no... Uh, desire to invent my own expression. So I'm happy to steal somebody else's logo. So I said, just do it. I yeah. said, let's not debate it. I know Nike invented that, so I won't take credit for it. But in our organization, it means something. Like, do you need to have a paralysis and discussion to achieve something that if you came and asked me, I'd tell you, well, this is the pros, these are the cons. I might make a mistake, but this is what I think we should do. Not with respect to obviously safety related issues, but business related issues, you know, take some risk take some risk. And so we put that into our DNA, that we become more of a, of a, of a entrepreneurial. company, entrepreneurial yeah. mindset. Then we continued morphing some of these messages as we became stronger. And in fact, now I talk about Air Canada as a 80-year-old startup. So why can't we have in our DNA and in our mindset some of the characteristics of a startup? Startups are ambitious. You know, startups have a lot of built-in systems that believe they can take on the world. They operate on audacity. And when I look at some of the, you know, the, the valuations that some companies that have been around for 24 months and they expect to have multi-billion dollar valuations as if that's a normal thing, well, that's audacity. Well, we could take, you know, companies like ours could use some of that audacity. So we started instilling in our mindset, in this culture, an entrepreneurial mindset, a just do it mindset, uh, having you know, the frontline people have a bit more discretion. Again, we're a rules-based company because we're a highly regulated, highly regulated yeah. and secondly, because of safety and other issues like that. So, so it has to be, you know, balanced. It's just not a total free for all, but something that you know, has served us quite well. Well, it sounds like it's a very values based approach that certainly serves companies and, and others well, but it wasn't a straight line. I mean, it, you know, we, we, we talk about the 10 years, obviously a lot of success, but there must have been a lot of criticism that came along the way. A lot of doubters, including markets and investors. How did you handle criticism? Well, first of all, I think s some criticism is uh, totally merited. And we, we would take criticism that was, let's say, customer-oriented, 
and try to solve it right away. Some of it is like easy, low-hanging fruit. When I say criticism, it could be something as simple as, what is our policy with respect to pets on board? What is our policy with respect to allergies? What is our policy with respect to ancillary fees and name changes? And what happens if someone gets stuck in traffic and misses his flight by a few minutes? What's the policy with respect to how much time before you check in? So criticisms like that, we actually took on board and and developed a customer-facing panel that would continue to, to drive improvements, which helped us improve our product and ultimately enabled us to win Best Airline in North America seven of the last nine years. Out of the uh, Canadians who are surveyed in these Ipsos Reed surveys, we're like 92% of Canadians prefer Air Canada to the competition on business travel. So th- this is what enabled us to act quickly where we had criticism that we could act on. Then you have criticism that people are preaching from their own corner of the universe. We had, as our shareholder group, we've had many short-term investors and hedge fund investors and so on. And and as I said, and I said without any uh, issues whatsoever from my vantage point was, we're not running this business for short-term investors. We're running this business for the long term. We're not managing our business from quarter to quarter with the view of having, you know, outsized uh, profits in one quarter and then maybe at the, at the expense of next year or uh, five years from now. So decisions that we're making, whether they're fleet decisions, whether they're route decisions, whether they're people decisions are made with respect to the long-term benefit and the long-term sustainable benefit of, of Air Canada. Uh, then I'd say, well, you know, we also have many differing groups of stakeholders. And this was one of the things that served me well in having been involved in the privatization because you had so many competing interests. Same thing now. So you have labor unions that have a different perspective that have to do a job. We have the employee groups themselves. We'll have our lessors and our creditors and our customers and our shareholders. And so balancing these different stakeholder groups and especially doing so very much in the public eye because Air Canada is so visible is something that we've we've said that we're going to zero in on each one of these stakeholder groups. And when I look at the 10-year dynamic, we haven't satisfied all people all of the time throughout the 10 years, but I'd say that when you kind of look at it after the 10 years, I'd say we've satisfied them all over the 10 years. And you're here and you're growing. And we're here and we're growing. I'm struck by, you know, your acknowledgement and the early adopter that you were of social media like YouTube. It seems to me that CEOs have really had to evolve their communication skills in their own companies to communicate with their employees. How do you view social media? You know, there's a lot of people who are scared silly of it, particularly in the C-suite. But in terms of risks and rewards, how have you been able to use it to your advantage? When we started in 2009, it was just not well known. And I was not comfortable at the beginning. It was something that had been recommended to me by one of my advisors who was, you know, in the marketing world. And um, I was really uncomfortable with it. I said, what happens if I do this? And then somebody takes my image, puts it out of context, puts text across, makes me look foolish. How's that going to work, right? Puts words behind my image and says words that are different than what I've said. Who knows? I mean, you know, people- All of which they could have done with a photograph. Exactly, exactly. Somehow we didn't fear that. Exactly. No, precisely. (laughs) And I had to get over that fundamental block block discomfort, and I did. And then we did, I think, half a dozen of them, and they were interviews that were much like this, where I would describe what the next two, three, four, five months were going to be, or maybe even one month in some cases. You know, those days we were living, you know, sort of hand to mouth. And so I'd say getting over that first mental block was important. Secondly, uh, I wanted to create a venue for people to communicate their thoughts. I talk about empowerment. We created something in those early days called Creative Juices, which was, if you have a creative idea, we needed to have a venue for you to to put it in. And in the old days, you'd have a suggestion box that would be beside the water cooler. And of course, we don't have water coolers or suggestion boxes (laughs) anymore. So we created an electronic suggestion box. That's before we had sophisticated intranet systems where employees can, and now we have that, you know, on a, on a right uh, online daily, your device. Completely, yeah. you know, it, it goes on all day long. You'll have, uh, and then the key was getting our people to actually monitor it. Cause if somebody put in a great suggestion and then no one answered him or her, that wouldn't be any good. And so, you know, we sort of, it was a combination of getting over the original hurdle, but then also conditioning the organization to say, well, this is something that's worth 
paying attention to, worth investing in. And we saw the impact of negative social media through our labor negotiations, much like the you know, U.S. election and much like you know, the interference so-called with democracy. You can have bad behavior using social media to interfere with a union process, with an election of their leaders or ratification of a contract that's put forward. So the social media dynamic, understanding it and knowing how to manage it has become increasingly important in, uh, in a big business, I would say. And you've been able to do, I think, as from what I've seen, a really effective job in your internal communications. You said you said you have thir- up to thirty-two thousand empl- direct employees, Correct. let alone yeah. the supply chain. How have you been communicating with them? How has that evolved in the decade? It's much more sophisticated than it was when we started, and so now we have a combination of four or five tools. So one is we have a, a daily communication that is online. We have a company, Intranet, which is constantly on the move. We also have uh, a system to reward employees for, for great service. And we use that as a, as, a, as a compensation tool where you get, you know, sort of the equivalent of loyalty points for doing great things, which is also done through the, uh, the social media intranet type of a, a driver. And we're using our own mini webcasts with short messages from some of our key executives, you know. So we'd have a short message on, uh, you know, when we're bringing in a new aircraft or a short message on introducing a new product or short message on a new marketing campaign. So this is, you know, a combination of video, audio, written text, and it's just gotten to a completely different level now. And of course, you're going to share this podcast with your employees We'll too. definitely <laughs> share the podcast, absolutely. Now, you've not only been doing internal communications, I want to take you to a speech that you recently gave at the Canadian Club. But before I do, I want to read a quote from a speech that you gave at Concordia University uh, when you received an honorary degree in 2016. And in your acceptance speech, you wrote that courage, courage is the most important driver of human achievement, including, and I quote, courage to be an unreasonable catalyst for change. So this speech that you gave in downtown Montreal, it took courage. Uh, I read it, and in it, you went so far as to endorse the need for pipelines. That's a really hot-button issue in this province. What made you do that? Well, when I talk about courage, it's not, uh, you know, to pat myself on the back or to pat anyone on the back who speaks out. I think that, you know, I, I have a fundamental desire to see businesses lead as opposed to follow policy. We cannot have an environment where, you know, businesses are lowest common denominator on the totem pole of things that matter because businesses create virtually all the jobs in the country. Businesses pay virtually all the pensions in the country. Businesses pay all the taxes in the country, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that when we identify that, we say, okay, well, what are appropriate compromises for the country? You know, I'd very much like to see the country stay together as a country. You know, we cannot have this isolation of the West, this, you know, dynamic that existed previously between the West and the East. We need to do things that make sense for the country. And I think that what I said in that speech is we have to figure out the pipelines once and for all in the East and in the West. And uh, that means, you know, having a right dynamic that recognizes environmental, but that does not completely deep six the pipeline project. And also the Quebec leverage over hydro and other things. So it's a, it's a grand bargain to some extent. No, no, say. exactly. You know, and I think that I, you know, my, my desire, and th- this is not uh, any kind of grandiose ambitions uh, other than to say that from the well-being of the country, the country has to be sufficient from coast to coast. And, and I think create that, wealth. And create wealth and create prosperity from coast to coast. And so I've seen how we can shoot ourselves in the foot by uh, being divisive. And I think that, you know, I, I, I didn't think it took very much courage to say <laughs> the statement I said about pipelines, because I think that's the right answer. And it's much easier when you when you feel that uh, you're, you're, you're on the right side of the issue. And, you know, the quote that you ascribed to me on courage uh, from Concordia, when I left Air Canada in 2004, one of my colleagues, a senior executive, wrote me a beautiful note, and he said in it, reminded me about this comment on courage, I think it was Shaw, who said that uh, all change has been as a result of the unreasonable man. You know, reasonable people don't actually create evolution and change. And I think that it was a a great way of saying, if you want to continue to evolve, you have to be somewhat uncomfortable, operate in the zone of of uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, let's um, pivot away to some other issues I wanted to explore with you. We've talked about your pride of being a Canadian, the opportunities that Canada has given you. Air Canada, of course, a very global brand. 
a very strong global brand. What are you seeing? What are you hearing about Canada in 2019? And what should we be looking out for in terms of how do we continue to strengthen this country? Well, you know, again, we are one of the most visible Canadian brands internationally. There's no question about that. And, um, you know, we, uh, as I like to say, if somebody was to say, ask you in China or in uh, Argentina or in Germany or in the United Kingdom to name, you know, five or 10 Canadian brands, chances are Canada would be on most people's lists. And so we do get a good perspective on what else goes on in the world. Second thing that I'll say is that my job and my position gives me access to what goes on in many other countries. On the board of uh, governors of IATA, which is the International Air Transport Association, I was the chairman of IATA for a period of time. I, we have Star Alliance, which has got 27 member carriers from 27 countries, and I was the chairman of that for a while. So I, I get an opportunity to visit the uh, emerging markets of the world, the ones that are moving uh, at a much faster pace than some of the developed markets and certainly faster than Canada. So that means countries like South Africa, like the UAE, countries like when we look at countries like Turkey, uh, all of the countries in Asia. So when we look at, at that and we say, so how do those countries, how do things happen there as opposed to here? What are some of the learnings? What are some of the opportunities? I conclude that Canada is not really that well configured from a competitive perspective. And there are some fundamental areas of opportunity for us. And that's not to target any particular political party or, or who is in charge, just but overall as a country. So what are they? One is the regulatory burden. As a uh, country that seeks to have growth, we have to be able to you know, not have uh, layers upon layers of overlapping regulatory burden that make it so difficult in so many industries for businesses to either get started or expand or to progress. I mean, an expression that that I've loved, that I've used, that I will repeat here is that when it comes to, to encouraging businesses to invest here, uh, governments have to figure out a way to roll out the red carpet, not roll out the red tape. And I think this is, this is something that, you know, we see all the time. It's easy to roll out the red tape to tell us 15 different ways why, you know, we need to, to go through these hoops to, to, to do something. And so obviously what, at no time were you saying compromise safety, compromise no. national interest, compromise anything no, else that no, Canadians no, Categorically, no. In our industry specifically, I was talking more generally about all industries, you know, that this regulatory red tape environment exists, you know, in the oil and gas industry, in the financial services industry, in the telecommunications industry, et cetera, et cetera. Etc. Et and I think that that's really where I was uh, heading with that. But specifically in our area, I'd almost put it as a second layer, is the indirect taxation burden. Even before you talk about the base taxation structure, say the indirect taxation, meaning, you know, rates, charges, in our case, landing fees that are more expensive than anywhere else, airport rent, security surcharges, uh, fuel excise taxes, CATSA, uh, you know, the way the security surcharge is built, money is not even reinvested. The profits that they make from security surcharge not reinvested in making the industry more more efficient and so that is that is a second layer which goes to the uh, rates taxes charges and, and, and regulatory expense of carrying on business does some of that explain why air travel is seen to be expensive in Canada compared to other countries? Yeah, correct. No, I'd say that the you know Canada tends because it's to, easy to blame Air Canada or the airlines for, sure. for the price, but ultimately, no. For, you know, Canada ranked something like 242 out of 250, to being negative, 242 mm -hmm. out of 250 in terms of the indirect taxation in the aviation the industry, burdens. regulatory burdens. Yeah. Which and, you pass on to the customer. And which have to be passed on to the customer. You know, airlines make a very, very narrow profit margin and uh, that's historic. And that's why so many airlines go under. And so from this narrow profit margin, that is passed on to the customer. And so we've been repeating that like a uh, broken record refrain through different uh, governments over the last number of years, over the last decade, certainly, with uh, virtually no movement. And I think that, you know, from a competitive perspective, it's going to come to haunt us at some stage. You know, now the most recent thing is the passenger, so-called passenger bill of rights, which was while, you know, from a aspirational perspective and from a political perspective, it sounds good when you say it. Any consumer protection legislation sounds good when you say it. But how you do it is what matters, you know? We're all in favor of having proper, well-thought-out rules, but there are layers and layers of complexity depending on where flights originate, whether it's a code share flight that is operated on someone else's equipment that you have no control over, uh, what the rules are in the country that you're flying into, not having a double taxation consequence. Aren't there global best place. practices we can draw from? 
There are some practices, but I would say that they're adequately different, that they're not capable of being fully copied. And so I think that, you know, Canada is uh, wants to join the party and it's, it's rushing this thing through, perhaps, you know, for the given that it's in an election year. That's a great example of something that will drive, will have the opposite effect of what they want it to have, which is potentially to result in lower airfares. It does have the possible effect, if not done correctly, of having higher fares. So while we're totally in favor of having a regime, that treats things fairly. I think that it's how it's done. So again, another another element of lack of competitiveness. You know, you've seen lots of people go across the border to take flights in the U.S., drive across the border and take a flight to from one of the border airports, whether it's Burlington, to go to uh, you know Disney World and so on, and save in taxes and charges and so on, because it's much cheaper to do that. And the border airports are attracting Canadians to drive across mm-hmm. the border. So, you know, you have this dynamic where somebody says, is there value in ensuring that the industry is competitive? Is there value in ensuring other industries are competitive? So I'm happy to take this outside of our industry specifically, because I think this is a systemic problem where there are opportunity in so many other industries. And I'd include, as I said, financial services and telecommunications and uh, the oil and gas industry and the whole discussion around pipelines in this as well. In other words, an approach to business where governments collectively say business is good, business is not bad. Business creates jobs. Business pays pensions. Business contributes to charitable enterprise. Businesses pay taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that mindset is starting to set in. And I think it's great to have the opportunity to continue to advance that dialogue. Disruption. What kind of disruption are you planning for in your business? Well, the disruption in our business has been occurring largely for the last 20, 25 years, which is this influx of, uh, I would say, it started out as an LCC model, low-cost carrier model, and now called ULCC, ultra-low-cost carrier model. And then it was a short That's competitive disruption. I'm thinking technologically. I mean, are we going to a place where there are no pilots sitting in the cockpit? You know, what, what kind of disruption, innovation, ad, advantages of AI are going to be applied in your business as you go forward? Well, AI, you know, AI will play a massive role. And in fact, AI in our industry will not be a, a project. It'll be a transformation, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's the uh, lingo that I'm encouraging our people to use as we're tackling a different AI initiatives throughout the company. It's going to affect, it's going to be affect the way that we receive data on our maintenance programs. It's going to affect the way we receive data on our customers and how we manage personalization through our loyalty program. So, you know, it'll just change fundamentally the way we think of business. But do I think that we will have airplanes anytime soon that will not have pilots in them? Not in my lifetime, I would say. Hmm, And I think, yeah, I think that we've got very capable drones and, and their drone technology is continuing to evolve. I think that their drone technology will be a precursor to what happens with uh, aircraft that are piloted from from the ground. But I think that we're many, many, uh, many, many, many years away from that. All right, look, as time winds down, let's go through some rapid fire questions on just a little bit more about you, if, if we can. What do you read? You know, it's, it's funny, uh, you're asking me this because I typically will read a couple of books because I leave one the wrong place and have to start another one. <laughs> But I'm reading Red Notice, which is a really, really uh, interesting book. It reads like a, it's like a detective novel, but it's, of course, you know, the story of the Russia environment in the 1990s and, you know, Putin's uh, dominance over there and so on. Very, very, very fantastic book, which is, which is not fiction. And then I will occasionally read fiction detective type novels. And on the business side, I'll typically flip through a book. You know, I often quote to our leadership team, an author that I like a lot is the New York Times, uh, journalist Thomas Friedman, who's got some mm-hmm. great uh, ways of turning a phrase with many of the topics we covered. Uh, yeah, tonight. indeed he does. Uh, outside of work, what are you really into? You know, I try to stay fit, you know, skiing, cycling, hiking up mountains. I have done some pretty big mountains in the past, but it's, uh, you know, anything that will kind of enable me to stay in reasonable shape. And it's great to also see that colleagues in the industry and, uh, you know, other people that I hang out with who are doing similar jobs to mine have got that same mindset and we can do things together. Well, our listeners have figured this out, but it's amazing how many CEOs in just a short number that I've had the podcast with are either marathoners, uh, mountain climbers. I mean, I don't know if we're suckers for punishment or what, but they're certainly driven by big challenges. Yeah, it's not, you know, it may have been the challenge earlier on, I would say, like now it's morphed into something different. It may have been the challenge originally when, you know, we, we wanted to climb that such and such a 
a mountain and you know feel like you achieved it and you're still alive now it's less the challenge than it is truly it, it's it's uh, the endorphins kicking in you know you it, you feel differently when you you have that sensation and i i know right away if i haven't worked out in a while you know you sort of feel sluggish and all that and you don't your brain doesn't function as well Work-life balance. I mean, it's an issue for your employees, but it's an issue for you too. You've got uh, two kids, right? A son and a daughter, I, I think. have two kids who are both yeah. now well on, on their way with their own mm. lives. Uh, my son lives in New York. My daughter lives in Toronto. But growing up, yeah. they must have wondered where you were because you were saving your well, Canada. you know, I always, yeah, but you know, I always, uh, we always found time. And that's not much of an excuse for lots of people who, who uh, you know, to be frank, and, uh, you know, maybe people live their lives differently than I did, you know, to say that, you know, when I hear stories, you know, I'm married to my job, that's why I lost my family or lost my marriage or lost whatever. Mm. It's a bit of a cop-out, my opinion. I think that you can certainly organize yourselves to be able to have both. And that's what I always tried to do. What advice did you give them as they went through life? Yeah, I mean, part of the advice was that with this idea that uh, no one owes you anything. And uh, that was one of the important drivers that, you know, while, while their lives undoubtedly emerged differently than mine did, different means and different stages of one's development, it's the best way to approach it. And they both had great ambitions. They both did well in, in school and university, and they both established great careers that uh, sustained them completely, you know, independently of whatever I do. Mm. Now, coming back to sort of how you relax, I'd read that you are known for winning trivia contests, particularly in the category of movies, 1960s television shows. Where does that come from? When I came to Canada, I remember telling you that my parents wanted to ensure that I was going to speak English and hopefully French without much of an accent. So you know, I actually would watch a fair amount of stupid sitcoms. Uh, in the uh, so I, I you know I would you know there was the Beverly Hillbillies or the Lucille Ball or uh, uh, Green Acres or uh, any of those uh, shows like that and uh, yeah no and and it's funny what you remember but I could uh, tell you the uh, the names of many of the actors and the characters and the Mr Ed show and uh, now you know I think that your sources may have used that as a cop-out because I'd occasionally have competitions with other CEOs on on music as well. Hmm. You know, 60s and 70s and 80s music. What kind of music and, do you listen uh, to? I used to listen to a lot of uh, rock music uh, in the 70s. And so I knew a lot of the uh, the musicians, the rock bands and the songs around that uh, time as well. Well, look, time's just flown. I want to ask you a couple of final questions. And we have a word game that we play at the end of all of our podcasts. I say one word, you tell me what comes to your <laughs> mind and see where we go. But before we do that, I'll warm you up by asking you, what's the one word that describes who you are? Well, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's always hard to talk about uh, one's uh, self. I'd say that I've been given opportunities to be a leader early on. And I've always been in a position of leadership at uh, Stegman Elliott and then, you know, here. And I think that having uh, troops rally behind you is a great privilege. And I'm pleased to see that. And I think that that is something. I mean, when I have not been in a leadership type of a role, it's been more awkward for me. Mm. What's your advice for leaders today? Part of the advice for leaders is, is to empower others. My son joked about the fact that he had seen an interview that I gave. And I said, in many respects, I'd like to be the chief cheerleading officer uh, you know, as opposed to chief executive officer. And uh, he, he made fun of that. He said, what in the hell does that mean? It sounds corny. But the fact is that you get a lot of strength and leadership by empowering others and cheering others on to their successes. All right. Well, let's end with our word game. Here we go. Family. <laughs> Kids. Immigration. Positive. Luggage. <laughs> <laughs> Light. Not lost. <laughs> light, light. Travel light and you'll Travel go far. Light. <laughs> Travel light and you'll go far. Regulations. Burdensome. Competition. Embrace. Leadership. Empowerment. Canada. Unique. Thank you so much for doing this, no, Kayla. My, my pleasure. It's been fun. Thanks again to Kaelin Revenescu for being my guest on this episode of Speaking of Business. And that's a wrap for our first season. Hope you've enjoyed it. Right after Labor Day, we'll be launching our second season, featuring more of Canada's top CEOs, including Linda Hasenfratz from Linamar, Daryl White from BMO Bank of Montreal, Dean Connor of Sun Life, and many more. Stay tuned also for our midsummer special episode, 
we're going to try something a little different, and I sure hope you'll find it a lot of fun. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe for more conversations with Canada's top innovators, entrepreneurs, and business leaders. Search Speaking of Business wherever you find podcasts or visit speakingofbiz.ca, that's biz with a Z, to join our email list and follow us on social media. Until next time, I'm Goldie Hyder. Have a great summer.